Okay, so welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, welcome to this third in a monthly series of sleep science webinars with me, Dr. Sophie Bostock. If we have met before, welcome back. Great to see you again. If we have never met before, welcome. You have picked a cracking session to start with. Um, so if you haven't already, please do say hi in the chat. Just let us know where in the world you're dialing in from today. I am here on Hailing Island on the south coast of the UK. Uh, my background was originally in medicine, but I've spent the last 10 years specialising in sleep and following a sleep deprived climbing accident six years ago, I now spend most of my time in sleep education trying to help people avoid the mistakes that I made. Uh, I relatively rarely do things for the general public. So this year I'm experimenting a bit with doing some weekly videos on Instagram, YouTube, a fortnightly newsletter and this monthly webinar. So um, in January, we covered sleep, self-control and habit formation. And in February, I talked about sleep and mental health. And there's definitely quite a bit of overlap with this session. So if you missed it, don't worry, send me a message. I'll, I'll share the link with you um, and you can catch up on anything you've missed because this is only a in total 40 minute session so i will speak for no more than 30 minutes and we'll have 10 minutes for questions at the end um, and just as a heads up in case anyone is interested and would like to spread the word to colleagues brothers sisters mothers fathers um on April the 16th, so in three weeks time i'm going to be doing a webinar focused on shift workers but it will be quite a lot of detail around sleep hygiene which I'm going to skip through today um, so if you are interested then um, look out for the, the link that will go out in an email to you with the link to this recording. Okay so before I delve into the specifics of insomnia I'm going to do a very rapid recap of what is often called sleep hygiene. Um, you can get this advice pretty much everywhere on Google, but I think about sleep hygiene in terms of the three systems which influence the quality and timing of our sleep. So in a typical 24 hour period, your alertness will follow a rhythm like this, kind of increasing through the morning, a little bit of a lull after lunch, picking up around about 5 p.m. And then as it gets dark and we get sleepy, we sleep, and then the cycle begins again. So this rhythm, this pattern is controlled, as I said, by three systems. The first are your circadian rhythms or body clocks, and those thrive on routine. So if you hear the advice to wake up at the same time every morning, and I'm going to be saying that more than once today, this is because it helps to anchor all of your little internal clocks. There's one in every single cell in your body, about 37 trillion of them. So when we wake up at the same time, it means they're all in sync, they're all coordinated. And the brain, the body is able to anticipate what's going to happen next. And if you're lucky, an hour and a half before your normal bedtime, the brain will start to kind of switch on the melatonin tap, which helps to prepare the brain and body for sleep. So circadian rhythms are really all about routine, but they're also about light because the strongest stimulus to tell the brain that it's daytime is bright light. So we want lots of bright light during the day and we want darkness and dim light at least an hour and a half before bed. The second sleep system is called sleep pressure. Bit more straightforward, the longer you've been awake, the more you build up this increasing drive or pressure to sleep. Uh, because as we expend energy, we burn this molecule called ATP and it releases something called adenosine. And adenosine makes you feel drowsy. So the longer you stay awake, the more drowsy you get. And this is quite helpful sometimes when we're trying to increase our propensity to sleep. So we actually want to build up as much sleep pressure as possible. And I will explain a technique uh, to do that very shortly. The third system which influences the quality of your sleep is often called the, the stress balance. It's that balance between your fight or flight stress response and rest or digest processes. So if you imagine all the automatic processes in your body, breathing, heart rate, metabolism, they're all controlled by these two opposing arms of your autonomic or automatic nervous system. And so at any one time, the brain is trying to decide, am I under threat? In which case I better mobilize and get ready for action. Or actually, am I safe and secure? Can I actually uh, switch off, wind down and make it safe for sleep? So the vast majority of the 
advice that you will hear, which is often called sleep hygiene, um, is to support these three systems. I'm going to skip over that pretty quickly today because I'm kind of going to assume that a lot of this stuff you've probably heard before. And if you haven't, there is a sleep test on my website, thesleepscientist.com, where you can go through a little survey and it will churn out a report which kind of reminds you about which of these things might be helpful for you. But here is the crux of today. Sleep hygiene alone is rarely enough to solve insomnia disorder. So even if you're doing all of these things, and in fact, I speak to a lot of people who are really quite regimented about their sleep habits, and yet they're still struggling to sleep. So what is going on? Well, in order to be kind of classified as uh, suffering from insomnia, chronic insomnia, the clinical definition is a difficulty falling asleep waking up in the middle of the night or waking up feeling unrefreshed, which has a negative impact on daytime function for three nights a week for three months or more, despite adequate opportunity to sleep. So uh, if you are the parent of a young child, you're probably not sleeping enough, um, but you probably don't get the opportunity to either. So that's not insomnia, that's just parenting. Um, but for most people with insomnia, they will recognize perhaps some of these thoughts. Um, this was a, an email that I was sent. Some nights I just find it impossible. Even if I do a relaxation exercise, I can't switch off. I get really frustrated when my partner is sleeping soundly beside me. Why can't I sleep? And you can kind of feel almost the frustration in this person's voice as they're descri describing their sleep patterns. Um, and I won't ask you to raise your hand if these are familiar to you, but um, you can nod along internally. So what is going on? What is the difference between a short-term sleep problem and this insomnia disorder? Well, there's a nice model developed by a guy called Art Spielman called the three P's model. And it's quite helpful for explaining how this chronic disorder develops. So the first P in the model is called predisposing or risk factors. And if you're a woman, if you're getting older, if you have a kind of conscientious or type A personality, um, or if you have a family history. These are all things which can start to elevate your risk of insomnia. But those things alone will not cause insomnia. They're just sort of vulnerabilities. In order to actually trigger insomnia, you need the second P, the predisposing factor. And this can be usually any kind of stress. And it might be quite a short term stressor, might be a relationship problem, for example, that kind of stops you sleeping well for a couple of couple of nights. But because of the third P, it doesn't go away. So most humans are very adaptable. And even when you get the most shocking of news, usually we manage to kind of come to terms with it after a couple of weeks. And that kind of then won't develop into chronic insomnia unless the third P kicks in. And the third P are the perpetuating factors. In other words, the things that sustain, maintain poor sleep problems. Now, some of them are behavioral and you can kind of imagine, right? You, you've been really stressed. You're not sleeping at night. So you're very, very tired. So you start to drink more caffeine, perhaps uh, eat more fast food just to keep you going because you're so shattered. And then before bed, you're trying to relax. So maybe you start kind of drinking a couple of glasses of wine or a few beers to try and unwind. And actually that alcohol reduces the quality of your sleep, makes you even more tired the next day. So then you have to use even more stimulants. So sometimes this cycle is behavioral. But as I said, a lot of people I meet have really good sleep hygiene and they're still not sleeping. So what is going on? I think very often it's usually this last factor, conditioned arousal. You might have uh, heard of this in the context of a psychologist called um, Pavlov who fed his dogs and rang a bell every time he fed his dogs. And what he noticed was that even before he fed the dogs, after a while, he'd just ring the bell and they would start salivating. And he realized that they had learned to associate that bell with food and the body was starting to prepare for it. Our bodies are brilliant shortcut machines. They're always looking for our uh, 
trying to anticipate what's going to happen next. And unfortunately, in insomnia, when you've had enough nights of lying there, not sleeping, your brain starts to learn that your bed is the place that you don't sleep very well. So let's just kind of unpick these uh, these thoughts in a little bit more detail. For those of you who came to the mental health webinar, this will, this will be a bit familiar, but I will come on to some new stuff shortly. So just for example, you know, some of these negative thoughts, um, I'm a terrible sleeper, I probably have a heart attack and die because I'm not sleeping enough. I know those are things that often kind of cloud your mind late at night. And of course, those thoughts are associated with negative emotions. Those negative emotions switch on that fight or flight stress response. So we become more tense. Our heart beats faster, higher blood pressure, higher heart rate. We are kind of activated and keyed up for action. And so what can we do? Well, we wriggle around trying to get more comfortable. Maybe we just stare at the, the clock in despair. We reach for our phone as a bit of a distraction, all of which will actually tend to reinforce this cycle. And so insomnia, I think, really happens because we get stuck in this vicious cycle of what we call hyperarousal. Hyperarousal simply means your brain and body are in a perpetual state of stress, arousal. It's like keeping the stress tap on all the time, night and day. And we actually know that when you scan someone with insomnia in a, in a brain scanner, they have higher levels of activation in their brain during the day as well as at night. It's a complete misnomer that somebody who suffers with sleep problems is really sleepy. In fact, very often it's the, it's the opposite. They are wired. They are always on. They are doing stuff. They are busy. But they find it very, very hard to switch off. Um, and as I said, sometimes there are behaviors that reinforce this pattern, but very often it's the thoughts that kind of maintain it. So to solve this problem, this issue, clearly we've got to address some of the behaviors, but we've also got to address some of the thoughts. So the number one evidence-based strategy for treating insomnia is called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. It's not just one thing, it's a whole kind of toolkit. And I want to explain one of the least well-known, but most powerful tools in that toolkit tonight. But I'll, I'll run through the lot. Um, so, first of all, monitor your sleep habits using a sleep diary. This is really useful for a lot of reasons. Just getting a handle on what's going on. How bad is it? I know a lot of people who actually start using a sleep diary and realize, oh, they're not sleeping badly every night. They actually do have quite a lot of good night's sleep, but in their heads, it's kind of blown up um, out of all proportion. Second thing, get up at the same time every day, no matter how much time you've been asleep. This is fundamental, as I said earlier, for kind of resetting, syncing your circadian rhythms. Third thing, Practicing the art of relaxation. This is really for those of you who are literally wired all day long, buzzing around, incredibly busy, that rarely have a chance to stop until you switch out the light at night. If that is you, I'm afraid you've got to get into the habit of taking a little bit of time out, just rehearsing that process of relaxation winding down. And, and um, when it comes to questions, do ask if you need some relaxation techniques, but breath work, mindfulness, all really good for that. Getting active every day, I thought I'd better include this. If you were to do nothing else, but actually just become more physically active, probably your sleep would improve. In fact, um, it's been shown that just 30 minutes of movement, sort of moderate, vigorous physical activity a day can help to improve the quality of your sleep. So you could ditch the rest and just do the physical activity, but you may already be very active. Okay, now we're, now we're getting into the more technical aspects, which are really important for chronic insomnia. So first of all, create a positive sleep bed connection. This is to counter that conditioned arousal. Only use your bed for sleep and sex and nothing else. Now, there'll be loads of you going, oh, I quite like reading in bed. But if you sleep well and you read in bed, no problem. But if you're sleeping badly, I think I'm really going to encourage you to just try and preserve, protect your bed as this beacon of sleep and pleasurable activities, but nothing else. 
So you only get into bed when you actually feel sleepy. And if at any point during the night, whether it's at 11 o'clock when you go to bed or at two, three, four o'clock in the morning, you are lying there and you can't sleep, get out of bed. So don't lie there wrestling with it, going, oh my God, why me? Tomorrow's going to be a disaster. The moment that you experience those thoughts in your mind, go, oh, okay, I'm not having a great night's sleep. I'm just going to stop trying. I'm going to get out of bed. I'm going to go somewhere else in my home. I'm going to sit with a nice comfy chair. Um, I'm going to do a crossword puzzle. I'm going to watch TV. I'm going to do the ironing. I'm going to do some colouring in. And I'm just going to stop trying to sleep. Because the more you try, the harder you try, the less likely it is to happen. And what you'll probably find is after half an hour, maybe an hour, you actually do start to feel a little bit sleepy. If you feel sleepy, that is your cue to get back into bed. We're retraining the brain here for you to see the bed as a place of restful relaxation. We can come back um, to that. Point six, sleep restriction. This is the this is the powerful, super powerful technique. And the final um, sort of topic area is cognitive reframing, um, mindfulness, acceptance therapy. These are all ways of dealing with unhelpful thoughts. I discussed some of those at the last webinar as well. Um, but I think to be completely honest with you, it's sleep restriction therapy that has the most powerful effect. Why do I feel very confident about that? Well, there was a paper actually published late last year, which compared um, sleep hygiene advice, you know, all that kind of typical habit stuff, um, to sleep hygiene plus sleep restriction therapy only. So it didn't teach any of the cognitive stuff uh, and actually found that just doing sleep restriction therapy um, was a much more potent way of improving sleep than sleep hygiene alone. So I feel pretty confident that even if you only take sleep restriction therapy away from this session, um, you're going to get something out of it. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, please grab a pencil and a pen. You may even need a calculator. We're going to do a very small amount of maths. Uh, so in order to know whether sleep restriction therapy might be helpful for you, you need to calculate your sleep efficiency. Now, this is ideally done for an average for a week, but for the purposes of demonstration, we'll just do it for one night. But try and remember, this is really about a whole week. So your sleep efficiency is the proportion of time in bed that you actually spent asleep. So, for example, if last night I went to bed at nine quite early, I got out of bed at seven, I would have spent 10 hours in bed. But I had a wretched night's sleep. I only actually slept for five of them. This makes the maths very easy. My sleep efficiency is the number of hours that I spent asleep divided by the number of hours that I was in bed times 100 to get a percentage. I am hoping that this makes sense to you. To confirm that it does make sense, um, I am staring at Ken who's nodding, which is great. But also what I'd love you to do is to try and calculate your sleep efficiency for last night. You can do it as a kind of, you know, an idealized, make the maths easy night. But just to give me an idea, um, chuck into the chat your sleep efficiency for last night. And if you have any problems with that, let me know. Um, of course, last night may not be representative. Don't worry if you don't want to sort of share last night. It's just to give an idea that people are managing to calculate this sleep efficiency, the proportion of time in bed that you spent asleep. OK, wonderful. I have got some numbers coming through. 75, 60, 20, ouch, 88. OK, 100. Andrew, right. OK, so you're never going to have completely 100 percent. It's always going to take you a little bit of time to fall asleep. Perfectly normal for it to take 15 minutes to fall asleep, 15, 20, even half an hour to fall asleep. And you will usually have maybe a few minutes awake during the night. That's not a problem. That's a normal part of sleep. So probably we're aiming for something in an ideal world of 85 percent or above. So if your sleep efficiency is less than 80 to 85 percent, I'd say sleep restriction could be a really useful tool for you. So what do we do? How do we? Um... <laughs> Vicky, Vicky hasn't got a calculator. Vicky, you're at least kind of, you know, I reckon uh, less than 30 percent. So this is a good one for you. 
So what do we do in sleep restriction? Well, this is going to sound very counterintuitive when you are desperate to sleep, but actually all we do is we spend less time in bed in order to improve sleep efficiency. So what we're doing is we're going to drive up your sleep pressure. We're actually going to delay the time that you get into bed by 30 minutes, an hour, even a couple of hours. And in doing so, we increase that natural sleep drive that you have, your propensity to actually want to sleep. So for me, for example, um, I had a 10 hour sleep window and in order to increase my sleep pressure, um, I'm going to reduce that sleep window to eight hours. So I then have a choice. I could go to bed at a normal time. Uh, and just wake up very early or I could go to bed later. In my experience, people find it much easier to delay going to bed. So, for example, I might start going to bed at 11, still getting out of bed at 7 a.m. When you start doing this process, it's really important that you keep a sleep diary. So you're keeping track of what your goals are and how well you're actually managing to stick to it. I'm going to show you an example in a moment, which will bring this alive. And I promise it will make more sense. But essentially, as soon as your sleep efficiency starts to increase, you can start to increase your sleep window. Now, some of you may have tried various online courses for uh treating insomnia and you may well find that they start with a very aggressive sleep window. So in this example, because I was only asleep for five hours, some people will give the advice to just stay in bed for five hours or six hours. I find that tends to make people quite anxious and I would suggest that rather than being super aggressive that you just delay your bedtime by an hour to start with but you can kind of see how you go. So long as you always get out of bed at the same time, that's the most important ingredient. I will caution this technique. If you drive a lot or operate heavy machinery, there is the chance that actually delaying bedtime in the very short term is going to make you more sleepy. That's kind of the idea. We're going to increase your sleep drive. So you might want to save this for a period of holiday or a period when things are a little bit less stressful, um, when you know that you'll be able to kind of have a few extra naps or something during the day to, to kind of get through it. So I promised you that it will make more sense when I show you an example. So this is from a, a favourite client of mine, my favourite because he was quite neat when he filled in his sleep diary. So I like to use this example. He also has very simple maths, which makes things good for me. So um, this was Harry. Uh, when he contacted me, he had not slept well for, well, he said decades. He may have been exaggerating, but uh, essentially he was pretty desperate. He was going to bed around 10.30. Um, this was sort of uh, around sort of the end of COVID. So he worked at home. So he was able to be quite flexible about his wake time, which didn't really do him any favours. So he'd kind of get out of bed any time between 7.30 and 9 during the week and then try and have a lie in at the weekend. But realistically, he said he was only getting two or three hours of sleep a night. So his sleep efficiency was only 20 to 30 percent. So very low sleep efficiency. And as far as he was concerned, only sleeping a couple of hours a night. So what was my advice to Harry? Well, hopefully, having listened to the start of this webinar, you kind of know the advice. So what did I tell him? Get out of bed at the same time each day and keep track of it using a sleep diary. Go to bed an hour later. So instead of 10.30, I want you to go to bed at 11.30. I also advised him to go and get some sunlight within the first hour of the day because typically his routine was to roll out of bed and just sit at his desk. So he wasn't actually getting any exposure to natural light. So his body clocks were probably quite confused about whether it was night or day. Take 10 minutes to switch off during the day. That's all I said. Maybe do read a book, do, do some breath work, do some yoga, do some stretching, whatever it takes. Just 10 minutes of doing nothing. And then finally, dim the lights two hours before your new bedtime. So this is really just kind of turning down the overhead lights. I often recommend that people light a candle because that's a good reminder to sort of dim the lights um, or wear blue light blocking glasses. Now, blue light blocking glasses, the evidence for them isn't brilliant, but his wife had bought him some for his birthday. So I was like, look, you might as well use them. Um, but really, I think dimming the lights would have more of an effect. OK, so. Let's have a look. What happened to Harry's sleep diaries? Um, 
hopefully you can see this, but essentially in week one, he was not incredibly disciplined at getting out of bed at 7.30, 30, which was supposed to be the time that he was supposed to wake up. Um, so as you can see, uh, it was a little bit of a mixed bag, but he did get quite good quite quickly at going to bed an hour later and he'd write in the time if he didn't manage to kind of go to bed as planned. Um, his sleep efficiency in week one was still very, very poor. As you can see, he was spending 10, 8, 8, 9, 10 hours in bed and only sleeping for a couple of uh, hours at a time. But in terms of sort of tracking these behaviours, and I'll give you a template for this that you can uh, fill in with your own behaviours, he was pretty good. He was really quite consistent in this first week. So, of course, Harry comes back and says, Sophie, I'm doing everything you told me and it's not making any difference. And I said, Harry, how long have you had sleep problems? And he said, oh, about two decades. I said, Harry, it's going to take more than one week. Stick with it, my friend. So he did. And this is his sleep diary for week two. So he got a bit better about wake up times or just anything between 7.45 and 9 at weekends. I did tell him he could have an hour's line at weekends. I'm not that cruel. Um, uh, but he got very good at going to bed an hour later. Uh, but what actually happened, he also was very, very good at doing his sleep habits. And as you can see, his sleep efficiency at the end of the second week, he had not one but two nights where he actually slept through the night and he couldn't quite believe it. He said he hadn't slept through the night since he was a kid. Um, now, I'm not going to pretend to you that after that he was magically cured because that's not what happened. But his sleep efficiency, as you can see in the second week, probably crept up to something like 40 or 50 percent. And over the subsequent six weeks, his sleep efficiency improved week on week until two months later, he was sleeping through the night for kind of six, seven or eight hours on a regular basis but only through this consistent approach. Now, what I didn't have to do with uh, Harry was actually take him through a whole load of kind of cognitive exercises, because once he understood the, the science of what was going on, he kind of trusted the process. But in the previous webinar, I also talk a little bit about kind of trying to tackle some of those unhelpful thoughts. So, for example, just reminding yourself that Everyone has broken sleep. Everybody wakes up now and again. We have we sleep in cycles and in between cycles, it's incredibly normal to just wake up briefly, fall back to sleep. But the more you can just accept what's going on rather than sort of lie in bed fighting it, the better. And if you do find yourself fighting, that is the time to get out of bed. Now, before I come on to questions, I just want to cover one more little kind of mini topic, um, which is sleeping pills, because I'm sure lots of you have probably got questions about those. Now, um, tonight I'm not going to go through the different, different sleeping pills. Essentially, hypnotics are, they're sedatives. They don't actually give you true sleep. They help to kind of knock you out, but your sleep won't be quite as restorative. And very often there's a bit of a hangover effect the next day. And the research shows that actually both sleeping pills and this CBT type approach that I've explained can be similarly effective in the short term, but actually it's only the behavioral and cognitive strategies that are going to transform your sleep longer term. Because there's no evidence that taking a sleeping pill is in any way going to improve your sleep when you stop taking that pill. So it's no problem if you've already been prescribed sleeping pills to keep taking them alongside doing CBT. That's actually quite a kind of a, a good strategy. And then you want to just gradually taper down your sleeping pills with the help of a doctor. So kind of perhaps, you know, taking half uh, one week and then half again and half again until you, the pill is so small that you're not taking any more. And then the other thing that I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of you are going to have questions about is should I buy X, Y, or Z to help me sleep? And we can discuss some of those things um, in the questions. But before we do that, I just want to explain probably the single most powerful effect when it comes to poor sleep. As we have explained, anxiety about not sleeping is one of the key things that keeps people awake at night. So 
If I give you some kind of little sugar pill and I say, hey, take this, it's going to help you sleep. The chances are you will fall asleep at least 10 minutes faster because you're not going to be quite so worried. And so research shows that actually about two thirds of the effectiveness of sleeping pills is probably down to the placebo effect. So whenever we evaluate some kind of sleep solution, uh, whether it's a pillow spray or a magical pill, um, ideally we want to know that it's more effective than placebo. And unfortunately, those trials are very rarely done. So I will always recommend that people yeah, look for a randomized placebo controlled trial or at least look for a money back guarantee. So you're not throwing money away on stuff, which is just actually temporarily easing anxiety, but not addressing the underlying causes of poor sleep. Um, I want to stop there because I do want to give you a chance to ask questions. I'm sure that may have thrown up some questions in your mind so please do uh throw them at me you can either unmute and um share them out loud or please feel free to to throw them in the chat oh, no questions i don't believe it go on right i can see ken go on i'll be the brave boy and go first then brilliant um it's I'm back to your Harry here, which coincidentally yes. with my father's name, but that's got nothing to do with anything. Um, but I would say that my insomnia has come from decades. It's certainly down to a particularly worrying time in 1998 when I had a job that I didn't like, um, and that brought with it financial worries. Yeah. Um, those those have gone. You'd be pleased to hear, particularly from a financial advisor, I should know how to handle money. Um, so, um, but I still wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and it's getting back over. That's a difficulty. Yeah. Um, and and that's the, the difficulty I find. Strangely enough, if I'm away in our camper van, which is ancient and probably yeah. not the most comfortable, I can yeah. get nine, ten, or eleven hours sleep with that, no problem. But it does all. make total sense. Your, um, I hope this makes sense to you now that actually your bedroom and that bed environment has probably become an environment that your brain is now associating with broken sleep. So you can go to the camper van, which you've had <clears throat> great holidays in. It's associated with relaxation. Perhaps you didn't take those worry money worries at the time into the camper van. And so you've got very positive sleep associations with that environment. And people will often find this. Um, they'll say to me, look, I, I sleep really well on the sofa before it's time to go to bed because they're completely shattered. They've built up loads of sleep pressure. But the moment that they walk into their bedroom, you know, their heart starts pumping. They start to feel that kind of uncomfortable anxiety. Um, so that strategy of, do you know what? If you wake up three o'clock in the morning and you don't sort of not necessarily immediately fall back to sleep, but, you know, give yourself five minutes, maybe do some uh, long, slow breaths. Um, progressive muscle relaxation is a good one, actually. If you've never come across that, that's the exercise where you put each of your muscles under tension for about five seconds, count to five, and then slowly release. And you can start with your toes and you can work your way up to your head and it'll probably take five or 10 minutes. So you could try that if after that, you haven't fallen asleep that's when you get out of bed and okay. you just accept that you're going to have less sleep that night it's okay um but the good news is that after that broken night of sleep the following night you're going to sleep more easily and the chances mm. are that you might start to sleep through the night um so this temporary sleep restriction is to retrain the brain to know what it's like to sleep through the night and that might mean temporarily getting uncomfortably tired um yeah. <laughs> joanne says i have the same effect when away in the camper van uh lovely so hopefully that, that's helpful nanda uh, has also asked a question um about hormonal impact i'm gonna answer that in a second um right joe also says i've tried everything uh what have you okay all right let me um let me talk very briefly about um hormones because i think actually i'm going to probably do a separate session on menopause perimenopause um the good news is if you are having sleep difficulties because of uh, for hormonal reasons usually that uses leads to hot flushes for example it can also mean to just lead to hyper arousal like 
hormonal fluctuations actually put the body in a state of stress and that very often leads to sleep problems but the number one therapy the number one approach um, for sleep problems both in pregnancy in menopause um, for chronic pain uh, if you have depression heart disease it all swings back to this approach of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia now, for those people who are on the call and maybe feel like they've tried this and it hasn't worked, um, I would literally go through every step and really ask yourself, am I doing this? And then it might well come to more focus on this cognitive reframing piece, because the likelihood is that your body, after a prolonged period of sleep deprivation, is stuck in a state of hyperarousal. So we have got to retrain it to be able to relax physically, but also mentally. And actually, I've got one more slide that might be quite quite helpful for, for that. Um, this is research by a researcher in America called Alyssa Eppel. She wrote a lovely book, um, The Stress Prescription, I think it's called. Um, but she characterizes the fact that most of us know when we're in acute stress. You know, if you are stuck in a traffic jam and you're really, really late, you know that you can kind of feel the tension rising. But a lot of us we may not be in acute stress, but our brains are still in a state of arousal. And I would put a lot of that down to these. So you might be scrolling through your phone and you might not feel stressed, but actually continually consuming more information takes energy. The default mode of the brain is a kind of delightful daydream. So when you're concentrating, it actually leads to a state of activation. And so a lot of us get stuck in this kind of yellow mind state, and we've almost forgotten what it's like to relax. And so exercises like yoga nidra, which is a very deep uh, relaxation technique, can be really good for bringing us out of the yellow mind state and retraining us to get into a state of relaxation. So um, hypnotherapy is another approach that some people have found helpful for that kind of deep relaxation state. Um, but, but yoga nidra, you can get recordings on the internet. And in fact, um, when I send around the court recording to this, I'll signpost some just in case, in case you want um, to look at that. Uh, Joanne, I'm just looking at the chat says does high cortisol impact sleep 100% Joanne um, I don't think I've got uh, have I got yes I have right um, I've got a slide on this that some of you may have seen before but essentially our circadian rhythm in cortisol is for it to peak first thing in the morning and to die off throughout the day and that allows melatonin to do its job you can almost imagine that that cortisol and melatonin have this almost mirror-like effect because you're either being energized by mel by cortisol or you're unwinding thanks to melatonin but um Cortisol is a much stronger hormone than melatonin. If you think about it, it's a survival hormone. Uh, it releases glucose into the bloodstream. It's oriented to make us move. So if you are stressed or you have high levels of cortisol and coming on to the um, shift work webinar, shift work will do this to you. A circadian disruption will um, elevate levels of cortisol. And that can mean that it's much harder um, for the brain, the body to prepare for sleep. Um, so yeah, anything that you can do to practice the art of relaxation and bring your cortisol tap off is gonna help. And the busier you are, uh, the more you need to practice. Um, yeah, a lot of people reported difficulty sleeping because of COVID, um, still have difficulty sleeping now. Long COVID seems to put people into this perpetual state of hyperarousal as well. So the stress that I mentioned could be psychological, but it can also be physiological. So if you've got high levels of inflammation in the body, um, that can also disrupt the quality of your sleep. So um, it's often a multi-pronged approach that we're we're kind of talking about. I'm going to go back to the, that slide on CBTI because I think these are probably the most helpful sort of takeaways. You know, you might not be able to do every step in this, but if you can hit four or five out of those seven steps, you're going to start to strengthen your natural sleep patterns. Um, 
I am always very strict on time with these sessions because I know that you have things to do, um, your evening to get to. But if you have got more questions that I didn't cover today and you'd love me to cover in a future webinar, um, please do email me sophie at the com. as i said i will share the recording as well uh, and fingers crossed it will be helpful for you so thank you very very much for coming and um i hope you sleep well